So objections, pain points, cash value. That's the big, big thing which we touched on. We started with that. Is it maximized for cash value? How do I get that early cash value as strong as possible? I have heard from some people, some real estate investors, they expressed, hey, I've heard that if I take less money up front, I should have more long term. And then their follow up argument or follow up point is, you know, I don't really care. Like if this policy is going to produce between three to 5%, and if I take less up front, instead of 4%, I might get 4.2% or something like that. I don't care. This is a better cash alternative. I want as much money up front, not because I'm going to use all of it in day one, but if an opportunity presents itself, I can earn much, much more in my real estate investments than what the policy will produce me. This is just a great alternative to position the cash. So my point here is what we hear in objection or pain point is a lack of early cash value. The consumer's point of interest is maximizing that cash value from start to finish. Seeing more up front, I've seen so many people attracted to that, even more so than the long term. With all that said, if you design a policy properly, you'll have maximum cash value up front and long term. So the next two things we have here, opportunity cost and negative hit that ties into the point I just mentioned with early cash value. Here's a big one, IRR versus loan rate. So this is huge. Going back to that spreadsheet here, what do we see? Dividend at 6%, loan rate at 3%. Dividend at 6%, have you ever heard you're being paid a dividend of 6% and it only cost you 3% to borrow? Maybe it was 5% when the loan interest rates had a higher floor than they do today. So, not the dividend rate, IRR, which represents internal rate of return, net growth rate. Several years before I see benefits, meaning when, several years before I see a positive internal rate of return, a greater earnings rate than what the actual cost of borrow is. This is what people are interested in. You got to confront this head on. That's my opinion. And then this one too, I don't want to have to pay forever. I hear this one quite a bit. Um, you don't have to pay forever by any means. You can design a policy where you pay into it for between two to five years. Very easy to do that if you're interested in that. So let's touch on this point, the IRR versus loan rate. A major pain point or major item of frustration here is lack of transparency. Some have described it as misinformation with respect to what am I earning on the policy compared to what am I paying. So for a long time, we would hear you can earn a dividend rate of 6% on a life insurance policy and only pay 5%. Now where that comes from is a company may be crediting a dividend interest rate of 6% and the loan rate with that life insurance policy is 5%. What we have to the right of it is updated numbers since the recent 7702 change, which could be a 6% dividend interest rate with only a 3% cost to borrow. Here's the important piece though. A dividend rate on a life insurance policy is not the actual earnings rate. Think of it this way. If you have $100,000 in cash value and you're, you are earning 6%, what should it grow to the next year? Going back to the visual here, this is an illustration assuming a 6% dividend interest rate. $100,000 goes in, $89,000 in cash value. So I paid in 100 grand, I see a 6% dividend rate. If I just have a bank account earning 6% and I pay 100 grand in there, the next year it's gonna be worth 106. Here it's negative 10%, a little bit more than that actually. Where I'm going with this is really just me trying to provide transparency on dividends and how it actually works is a dividend rate is a gross rate that is credited after the company's insurance expenses, mortality charges, everything that comes with the actual life insurance policy. So this has caused frustration and pain for consumers. Dividend of 6%, loan rate of 5%. From an agent's perspective, that is an accurate statement because I can say the company is paying a dividend of 6% and the company or the contract you have has a loan interest rate of 5%. So you can justify um, in saying that that is an accurate statement. However, 
From the consumer's perspective, some feel that it's misleading because when they look at their value, their cash value, say it's 100 grand, they look at the company's dividend rate of 6% and they say, I'm not earning actually 6%. I've heard from a number of people, I hear consistently from people who pay in between six and seven figures per year into their whole life insurance policies, that that annoys them a lot. And I've heard this expressed from the same people on a number of occasions. What they want to know, this is the, cons the voice of the consumer, what is the net internal rate of return, the net growth rate, and then the cost to borrow? Can I see that side by side so I can then make an educated decision? So important here because it's causing pain for consumers. So let's look at a visual here. Here we go. Here's the chart we just had up. Here's what I want to touch on. Here's taking it a step further, right? So what do we have here? Let's blow this up a little bit just to keep things consistent. 40-year-old individual. Same growth model, but we've got the net internal rate of return here. So here, we've got the $100,000 per year payments for 10 years, break even of year four. We've got the annual internal rate of return, and then we have the average internal rate of return. The annual internal rate of return is just what you're growing by year over year, and the average factors in the past 10, 20, 30 years. For example, what did you earn or what was your average return in the S&P 500 over the past 30 years? You might say I averaged out 8%. There you go. That's exactly what this, is. this does as well. The average will always be lower than the annual simply because it will account for the early years where I'm negative, where the annual is going to isolate your net earnings rate year over year. Here's where I'm going with this though. Here we've got a dividend interest rate of 6%. Year one, you've got a negative 10% internal rate of return. If you elect to take a policy loan in the first year, what's your cost to borrow? 3.04%. If you elect to take a policy loan in year five, like we have modeled here for $300,000, what's your cost to borrow? 3.04%. This does assume a variable loan interest rate, but assuming 3.04%. What's your internal rate of return? Annually, by pure coincidence with this model, it's 3.04%. So it's effectively a wash, isolating the annual IRR. Some people like to look at that saying, hey, what am I paying in loan interest this year compared to what am I earning this year? Okay, it's a wash. Some like to look at the average IRR. My opinion is whatever the consumer wants to look at, Focus on that with them. This is their money, not ours as the agent. If anyone says you should be looking at it this way, no, 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 no. It's their money. We should be looking at, looking at it however they want to look at it. Yes, we can provide additional information and they might say, hey, that's a good idea as well, but we do not want to, to, to try to force someone to look at it, look at things in the same way we do. I don't like it when people do that to me. Anyway, so I don't go off on a tangent here. Average IRR is 1%. Cost to borrow there is 3%. Okay. If I look at year 10, at that point in time, my average is just over 3%, almost a wash effect compared to the cost to borrow. And there's my annual IRR. So I'm earning more than what I'm paying in loan interest each year. That's with a 3% cost to borrow directly from a policy. Let's look at this example. Same policy, but with a different loan option, which has a fixed loan interest rate of 6%. So what do you notice here? When we look at the internal rates of return, both on an annual and average basis, let's just look at the annual. It tops out at 5% flat. Do we ever hit that? Or do we ever hit 6%? No, but that's what we're paying in loan interest to the insurance company. So important to look at that kind of stuff. What's the actual internal rate of return compared to the net growth rate? So some look at this and say, all right, when would it actually make sense then, Steve? If I'm interested in a policy for the concept of real estate investing, and I see here that it's a negative spread, especially when I look at a fixed loan interest rate or a higher loan interest rate, 
I don't know if it's a fit for me. Why do people do this? So going back to the whiteboard demo here, what do we've got? What do we have at the bottom? Cash value collateral loans. So before I just jump to that, right? Consumers feel that this dividend to loan rate statement is misleading. They want to look at the net internal rate of return. What is the actual growth rate compared to the net cost to borrow? So if I have an internal rate of return of 4% and I'm paying 5% to the insurance company, it doesn't really make sense. Versus a collateral loan, if I can get it at 3%, sometimes lower than that, now all of a sudden, if I'm earning 4% and paying 3% in loan interest, ah, makes much more sense. So let's look at an example here. We're going to look at a 52-year-old female. We've got a growth model up first, which I will forgo looking at that for this example. We're going to look at a direct policy loan very quickly. I'm not going to go through all the same details. Then a collateral loan, then compare them side by side. So what we have here is a case where she did not want to pay into it for a long time. We looked at some models with longer funding. Break-even point here is year five. She's paid in $1,080,000 and she has just over $1,080,000. Okay, there's your annual IRR. There's your average IRR. So we can see what's the net growth rate over time compared to a direct policy loan. What do we notice here? This is actually not a variable loan rate. I gotta correct that, it's a fixed loan interest rate. Here we go. She takes a $1 million policy loan out. The cost to borrow, 4.76%. That's the net loan interest rate each year. When I look at the IRR, let's look at the annual because that's gonna come closest. Does she ever hit 4.76%? No, she gets close. And you could say, hey, this is a tax-free yield over here, because it is if we don't trigger a MEC. But still, I don't hit the 4.76%. That's a pain point for some individuals, a lot of people actually. So what we've got over here is the loan interest she's paying each year. There's the interest due in red, and then there's the payment in purple. Okay, so it comes due, she makes the payment, and then you've got the full loan repayment, the principal payment, I should say, over here in bold purple at $100,000 per year. So for example, let me just walk through this properly. I pull out a $1 million policy loan. The year that I actually take the $1 million at 4.76%, there's the loan interest due for $47,619. Here's the loan interest payment. There's the total interest I've paid thus far to the insurance company. I don't make any principal payments that year. Year six, I make a $100,000 principal payment. There's the loan interest, 4.76. It's $42,000 and change because it's based on the $900,000. I pay the loan interest, total interest paid. So what we did in this example, this column in bold black represents the total interest I've paid to the insurance carrier when I tally up all interest payments. So about $262,000. Keep that number in mind. Let's go to the collateral loan. So here, we've got the same policy on the left. There's your internal and annual internal rate of return and average internal rate of return. Here we go. Cash value collateral loan. So I take this to a bank or lender, assign my cash value to them as collateral, they would give me a $1 million line of credit. And we do the same thing here. At a 3% interest rate. At 1 million, where interest rates are right now, you could probably get that down to 2.75% with some banks, but we kept it at 3% here. Not 4.76%. Here's the interest payment. There's your total interest. What do I notice? What was it in the last example? About $260,000, almost $100,000 less. Same principal payments here on the far right, 100K per year. So when we look at the cost to borrow at 3% compared to what she's actually earning, we would see from an annual standpoint, 
she's negative the first five years. Beginning year six, she's got a positive internal rate of return. When I say positive, she's earning more year over year than what she's paying. And then average takes a while, over 10 years at year 11, which this is also a variable rate. It could be higher at that point in time. So let's look at a comparison here. We're nearing the finish line. Fun stuff, right? This just shows them side by side. There's the direct policy loan, not a variable, but a fixed rate. And then there's the cash value collateral loan. Here's what I wanted to do here. Just put them side by side and mainly tally up the total interest payment because this is the kind of stuff I found people are interested in. With a direct policy loan, I've paid, it, I've paid an interest $262,000 versus the collateral loan, one hundred sixty-five. dollars now, to sprinkle in some pros and cons to both of these, with this guy, you've got way more control. With a direct policy loan, you pay it back how and when you want. Simple as that. Very, very convenient. You can pay it once a year. You can pay it once every three years. Never. It's up to you. When I say never, provided we have sufficient cash value so it doesn't lapse. With this guy, because we are working with a bank or a lender, is a bank going to allow you to defer interest payments? Probably not. The banks we work with or the ones that I've referred people to do not. And most banks do not. So we are required to make interest only payments each month if we have a loan outstanding. So if you have a $1 million line of credit approved and you don't draw on it, you're not gonna have any interest due obviously. But if you have a loan outstanding, then what will happen? Well, whatever the outstanding loan is, interest will be payable to the bank. But by giving up a little bit of control, we do save ourselves quite a bit in interest. So that's the kind of stuff I want to see up front so I can then make an informed decision. Interesting stuff, isn't it? So let's wrap up with some questions. What are the drawbacks? We touched on a lot of it here. Well, the drawback, just when we look at the actual cash value life insurance policy is what? I've got negative equity up front. It's going to take me between four to six years, depending on the company and product, to break even. We saw in that age 40 male, our break even point was year four. The break even again refers to I've paid in at that point in time, year four, $400,000, and I have $400,000. With the 52 year old female, at year five, she broke even. She paid in just over a million dollars, $1,080,000, and she had just over $1,080,000. It was year five. So for real estate investors, what they often ask with the drawbacks here, when's my break even? But the question that comes up is, can I earn more with my money that I'm losing by putting it in a life insurance policy? Can I earn more with it by putting it into real estate investments? Or do I know, hey, I usually have excess cash here. I can move that cash over to a life insurance policy. I'm comfortable with the upfront hit because I know with, with quite some certainty, I'm not gonna need access to all of that money or any of it really right off the bat. That's usually the type of individual that does like this a lot. If somebody says, I'm gonna need access to every penny because I can maximize my returns off of it, this might not be the best option, at least not right now. Can I see the guarantees? I didn't touch on that. So if we look at the female example here, we've got three examples, two of which are the same thing. These two are identical. The middle example is the example we looked at with those loan models based on the company's present dividend rate. And we've got the annual IRR and then also the average IRR. The example on the left, assumes the guaranteed rate of 3%, same payments, break even point between years eight and nine. Annual IRR, average IRR. Look at that. So an absolute worst case scenario, which is good to look at. A lot of people are interested in this, so we show it to them, simple as that. Okay, so annual and average IRRs, versus the loan rate, we touched on that. Some other questions we get. Do you help find deals? So that's usually a personal question. Do you help your clients 
find real estate deals? Me personally, no. However, contacts we have, yes. Uh, we, we have begun um, working with people, I should say interviewing some people that are directly involved in real estate investing, whether it's syndication deals, maybe it's finding deals that are experts in their field. I'm not an expert in it. I've got some personal experience just with the commercial real estate um, that I have, but I'm not a savvy real estate investor by any means, and I will not pretend to be one. I am a life insurance nerd at the end of the day, and I'm okay saying that. But to answer that question, do I help, help find deals personally? No, however, I do have contacts that do, that when we find the absolute best fit, um, we will market them as well to say, here's someone we work with and recommend. With cash value collateral loans, so the assistance we provide is, if you would like a cash value collateral loan, typically um, I like to provide a number of lenders if you say, hey, I like this lender, I'll send a personal introduction to you to the contact we have at a bank or lender. And then if you give that bank or lender permission for us to provide information on your behalf to your policy, then we will provide information to the bank, uh, such as your policy status report, showing all the updated values as the bank needs, um, helping facilitate all the paperwork to get to the insurance company in the timely manner, making sure the collateral assignment is placed, all of the in-between steps, just again, to make sure everything goes through in a timely manner. Last set of points here. So what we do, what we do policy, <laughs> So specifically, what we do, IBC Global, <laughs> maximize cash value life insurance policies. That is our niche. If people ask me, hey, what do you do? We sell whole life insurance. Really? You sell life insurance? Yes, but about 1% of people we work with are actually interested in the life insurance piece. Really, what we do is set whole life insurance policies up for maximum cash value from day one throughout the life of the policy, maximum flexibility. This way it doesn't feel like a bill. For example, a lot of people we work with may want the ability to pay in, call it $100,000 per year, but they don't wanna get a bill for $100,000 per year. So we'll design the policy in a manner where I can commit just to a minimum premium, call it $10,000, never feels like a burden, and then just pour in excess cash at my discretion. So that's how I maximize the flexibility. Minimum commitment, ability to overfund a policy. Track the performance. So everyone we work with, uh, we reach out to them every six months, provide policy audit reports uh, from the insurance carrier. We also put it on our own report, reach out for review meetings, have review meetings. What I have thoroughly enjoyed doing over the years is tracking the performance of life insurance policies for people that have, have had policies in force for a year, three years, five years, eight years, however old it might be. This way I can see what did the original illustration project and then what's the actual performance look like? Keeping our finger in the pulse of the policy, the company, the industry, everything. And then model loans, excuse me. This is before starting a policy. What's it look like if I take out a policy loan and don't pay it back? I only pay the interest. I pay it back in full. What does that look like before I start a policy? Well, what about after I have a policy? It's important to keep up to speed on, the, on this kind of stuff. So we do before and after and provide ongoing support. Hope you enjoyed this one. If you're a real estate investor, if you're not a real estate investor, I do hope that you enjoyed this. If you have questions, would like to see any models or just discuss this in general, feel free to reach out anytime. Um, and as always, I hope this helps. Thank you so much. Hey guys, Steve Parisi here. If you enjoyed the content you just saw, please subscribe, like, and hit the notification bell for future videos. If you'd like more information or to see some custom policies for yourself, feel free to call or email our offices at the contact information below.